I went through this, guys. I really went through this. I don't, I don't know if people realize, you know, people think that I was born that I could do all this. You know, I was in your stage. I didn't know. I didn't, I, I didn't, you know, I think more so because Graham was was got sick at 13 months. Like I just didn't realize that this was going to be um lifetime stuff. Yeah, I I I think I have everything. I have your hip stuff and I have the x-rays um and I'll mark that up and, and we'll go through um but you know just just and this is what we're going to be covering today and stuff but when you're going through like 28 surgeries and doctors and all this and you know every week my son still has a medical procedure done to him um he's doing really well but it's 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 been it's been a uh something and um, and even Aaron and I were talking about it because her her daughter having all these issues, you know, there's there were two big big problems with that. First of all, Aaron makes like the cutest kids ever. Not that we all don't do, but and I don't know why people think, well, if a child's good looking, that they they don't have issues or they don't have concerns, which I don't know what that has to do with the price of eggs. And then Two, Aaron has children with SMA. So they were like, well, she doesn't have SMA. Well, we, we get that, but there's 50 other thousand things that you could have. And, and, and that's what was her case. You know, when you start having multiple children, no offense, Aaron, you know what I mean? Like more things going to show up because versus, you know, if you only had a one child and, um, but, but still it's, it's, it's too much stuff is showing up. But the fact that, that her concerns were being brought to the attentions of doctors and sort of poo-pooed, because it was an SMA. And that, that was the biggest problem I had with Graham and having the autism. They, they I'm like, guys, he's so sick. And they're like, no, autism, ki autistic kids don't get sick. I'm like, what does sick have to do with the autism? Two, two separate things. So anyway, with that being said, let's get going. So what we want to talk about is is the is is five good key things of what looks like for high tone. Um, what I'm trying to do with all these webinars, my main objective is is I can tell if a baby's okay or not from like the second they're born or or the second that they have a problem. Um, I I didn't back then again with my gram and stuff, but but now it's 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 a no brainer, especially if I touch a child. Um, I've actually worked on um, and I have it sitting in the closet since COVID, uh, a complete sensory mat basically that would take my hands and put it on a on a sensory that you could lie a baby on. But but again, that's that's gonna that's gonna need some serious. Someone take the project, funding all that and and get it going. And I, I really need to at least put that out there um, and see if someone bites. But there's no reason why I should be able to tell if your child's going to be okay or not when nobody else seems to do it. And I'm not saying that as a brag. It's just that I've learned something and I need to teach it. So what we're trying to do is really define all these things to catch it ahead of time because it's like... You know, you just see it, I, you know, even when I do my research, not all birth trauma leads to cerebral palsy. And I'm like, dude, okay, fine. If it doesn't lead to cerebral palsy, it's still going to, you're still involved in some kind of therapeutic intervention. And and people go, well, yeah, but it was just early intervention. You're still involved in some, you know, the, the, the chances of your child just going into a typical, I'm just going to close my eyes, go on Facebook, and my child's just going to develop you know what I mean? Like after you've had a, like cords wrapped around the neck and forceps, you know what I mean? Like we, we gotta, we gotta, you know, most likely we have some sort of, of intervention that needs to happen. And where do we go from there? So what we're looking at is, is again, is how to define those early signs. And I'm not here to diagnose. I'm not here to diagnose anything, but I'm here to say like, again, there's issues. So, so now had I known you know, Graham being, this is the last good picture of him. And I'm sure many of you have seen this before. And this was the next picture of him. Like I, his going from cruising, talking and all that to, to a, to a three month level, that was just, that wasn't a progression like this. This was like, you know, and he went back to, 
to 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 horribleness. The fact that he's he's drooling, he's, he's supporting his tongue, his head by his tongue. Like that's what this is. He's literally holding his head up with his tongue. You know what I mean? Like, and he just collapsed. Um, yes, he has a black belt, completely hypotonic, and 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 he he's he's my my bud. He travels with me and stuff, but geez, it just, it just shouldn't have happened. Now, of course, I'm going to have my disclaimer because I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm here to, to work with your movement awareness. Um, again, if you have any concerns and I am the first person, you see me on Facebook all the time, you know, doctors that way, ophthalmologists, whatever. And, um, actually too, Aaron and I were talking about like, uh, because, hopefully I've cracked a little bit of a code because we still don't know what's up with her daughter. Um, and she goes, how do you just Google and research the way you do? And I'm like, what? It's Google. You know what I mean? This is the biggest thing that I want to take away from parents is the worry, the waiting, the wanting. You know, you didn't plan for your child to experience, especially experience. It's one thing even to have the trauma, you know, I mean, just to have a NICU or PICU experience, just to have all of that, the IVs, the, 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 you're exhausted, you just had a baby or my case, you know, again, Graham was 13 months. Um, but, you know, I got to a point where people like, oh, so are you a nurse? Are you, a, you know, I'm like, no, I'm just a mom. And they're like, how did you learn all this stuff? You know, but because, because you weren't, because you weren't helping me. I, I had to go learn. How else am I going to talk about my son? Especially when you get into the rare conditions, which, which he has. Um, but this is where too, all kids are different, especially with special needs, not so much with typical development. They really should be, be one of the same, but I believe every parent, you know, this is one of my things is, and that's why I'm doing the parent workshop next week is CBI um, on the 19th, but, but um, please the, what we need is a plan, whether you, you typical, not typical, doesn't matter the day you leave the hospital. Now, if you don't want to do anything, that's one thing, but you should have a plan and that any time that you need a plan, it's available. I'm a pretty big advocate, even though this child's pretty severe here because she's intubated and stuff, or he um, is any child that has had two days or more in the NICU put your child at risk for developmental delays and or global delays. I know people think of like, oh, but my child's MRI is fine, this, that, and the other. What was the history? Uh, blown IVs to a central line to, to again, even if it is as severe, oh, you know, and I, and I, when I look at a child and say, oh, is it intubated? Yeah, but only for a couple of days, you know, it's like, what do you mean for only, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's going to affect your child, but, um, but this is this again, part of the plan. Are you getting any answers to your child's ability to develop? Now that's where too, I, I think people think because they're so, so see stiff and high tone are just symptoms. They're not medical conditions. Now they're, they're symptoms of many medical conditions, but but until you take the, the symptoms and match it with the diagnosis, you're not getting this, this, this here, the answers. You're not getting into that. And I don't think that's what people, they don't realize. So they think that, you know, when they go, oh, my baby, you know, was stiff, like um, my my niece just had a baby and, and the cord wrapped around the neck, neck, but also he busted it when he was being born. And they're just like, oh, little tanky, little fighter, ha, ha, ha. And I'm just, I'm working on it. And I'm just like, well, how do I tell her? We're like so CPing. And, uh, and, and she's like, uh, cause I said, you know, the legs, what's going on. And, um, and she goes, yeah, it's really hard to dress him because his legs just go straight out. And I'm just like, so, um, he got two good lessons from me, but, but again, you know, I, I can't go in on people, even with family and just say, you know, you have a problem. I, I wish I could do that more. Um, but there's a fine line of helping to alienating and I can't go into the alienation. But again, do we want to take th this and not know that we might be looking at this? And and what could we have done in between that versus it going into these kind of things? Um, and so you need to know why specifically high tone causes issues with development, but you also have to see where those conversations of high tone can come into.
So the five, five top signs really are first of all is NICU time. Um, I, again, I'm a real and and I'm not here to say don't do NICU time, by, guys, or don't do uh, these things because please, 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 the doctors and you are there to save your child's life. That's the priority. What you don't understand is a child that goes home alive is a viable birth. So it doesn't matter if that child goes home on a trach or out the door in your arms. You know, that's, that's, they, they, they survived childbirth. Um, and now you're going into a different realm of, of development. And I'm trying to narrow that gap because you think, okay, they're saying they're fine to go home and you're thinking they're fine. Um, and, and that's where you can have complications. So I'm not saying don't do the NICU. I'm not saying don't do any kind of medical intervention. You really need to find out uh, again or understand your child's development and where it's going to. Um, and uh, so birth trauma, prematurity, micropremie, um, fisted hands, fisted feet, but um, and able to lie down is a really biggie. Um, and then, of course, there's a bonus if you stay to the end. So first of all, you have to understand what type of child you have. Is it just stiff, high tone? Or are we looking at developmental delays? Like, like again, I have those little babies that are in this week. And she goes, well, I'm only concentrating on her because they said he was fine. And I'm like, who evaluated this child? Like, what, what fine? So she's like, what, both kids need it? I'm like, yeah, both kids need it. Um, but developmental delays and global delays are, are global delays in an infant is really considered non-responsive. Um, and then you're just going to go, but but still, the the U.S. government has come out now. These kind of conversation of of development are not to be evaluated till nine months. But yet, no, not on my ship. Nine months is just absolutely ridiculous. And again, is your child medically complex? So, yes, my child was globally delayed. He was low tone, by the way, and that's the next webinar in this series. Um, but he was very medically complex. Um, matter of fact, one doctor wanted to change his autism to medical delays. I said, you touch that piece of paper, I'll kill you. <laughs> you know, because again, medical delays, I'm not going to, again, that's just a symptom. I'm not going to get services with that. Whereas I am, and my son is autistic. So, you know, he's 20 years old now and he, it's not medical delays because he's at ASU getting a 3.6 GPA and he's taking Russian, but he's still full on autistic not not Asperger's, he's autistic. So so again, it's understanding what type of child you have. And this is what I had to go through. Again, they just kept saying, you know, and because everything became Graham's fault. Oh, he's just he's just too low tone to come to sitting. So so like you're not going to work on it? Yeah, well if he was if he was a bit stronger, but he's not. So where am I going with this? And he was on he was unable to get the muscles. And that's what people don't understand. Like I can go to the gym and take my muscle and make it larger. I can just decide not to go to the gym and my muscle will get smaller or weaker, but I still can affect. And that's what people, it's a really big misconception. And I don't use that kind of um, evaluation in my system because your grandma does not look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and still can drive a car and, and go to the store, hopefully because she's balanced, she's weight transfer, all the things that I try and teach you. That doesn't mean she's core strength, but she has core movements and she knows how to do it. So so I was like, well, if grandma can be low tone and get to the supermarket, then my son will be able to someday. I mean, th that was the logic that I started using to develop this. So when you're looking at risk for, for, for high muscle tone responses, because high muscle tone usually 98% is based off of some sort of trauma. Low tone usually suggests genetics, right? But but again, surgical births now, they're now saying prematurity is 37 weeks. I think, the, and then they go, and I have people coming in saying my child's age adjusted by three weeks. And I'm like, what? No, like well, they were born at 37 weeks. You know, we, we got to work on them as if they're, 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 they're not a month younger. Um. But there's a difference between active full-on labor, labor, even going into a C-section versus a scheduled delivery. Scheduled delivery, your child hasn't even gone through the, the, the whole thing of contractions. Um, uh, premature deliveries, low birth weight, 
um, life-based, meaning that, that even though you go full term and so forth, but they go on some sort of life support and even oxygen, oxygen is life support. You know, your baby should be able to breathe. And so that, that again, not always typical, but, but for a high percentage. And then there's complication risk again, not always typical, but again, post-delivery hospitalization. And this is where the conversation of NICU time comes into play because there's complications just because your child's premature or there's complications because your life-based medical stabilization. You know what I mean? That, that, that breathing can turn into an infection. Um, neonatal stresses, again, just lights and bells and beeping and someone coming in at 4 a.m., sleep cycles, circadian rhythms uh, all being thrown and early surgeries or traumas. Um, and I've working, well, I've working on shaken babies. I've working on drug-based babies. And, and you might might not be the type of parent that's coming in for that, but you might be the foster parent. I've, I've done plenty of foster work. And, and even too, I mean, you know, the, just because a baby's shaken, it could be the, the, the partner or the going on or, or someone was caring for your child. Um, literally, I've had caretakers call up, not called 911, um, but called the parents and they came in, heads all swollen and, and seizing. I don't know what happened and got a cracked skull. It's, 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 you know, life's not fair. So, what you're looking for with high tone two is that hyper responses. So they more of a startle. A high tone was usually more of a startle. A low tone, you're going to get the non-responsive. Again, high muscle tone, birth trauma, surgical trauma, abrupt C-section. You know, I mean, did they they pull? I'm covering this in the reflex course. You know, people think, oh, I just had a C-section. Yeah, but your child was probably pulled foot first versus or thigh or pelvis. You know, they'll go in and just grab a body part and pull. Um, uh, APGAR scores can be present from low to high. People say, oh, I have a high APGAR score. Yeah, but, but that might have been the 14th APGAR score. It might have started off low. Um, and and that's, that's what you heard. But an APGAR score is to talk from nurses to doctors. Nothing to do with development. Typical brain trauma versus genetics. Again, what, what people are looking at when there's birth trauma, sometimes they don't even look at genetics because they think it was just the trauma. So there's a lot that goes into it, but you still need the, the, the development. You still need the milestones. You know, you still need the movement, even though all these other things are going on. And people are worried about the CP being the ultimate diagnosis, but at the same time, there's a lot we need to work on with all of this prior to CP being the diagnosis. However, you do have to realize that in certain situations, you know, that CP has happened. Um, it's just going to be at what level. So if someone says I'm at high risk or low risk or medium risk for CP, act like you have it because most likely you do. Um, and, and what are you going to do about it? So NICU time of more than two days. Um, and, you know, as you can see, you know, look at look at what's going on. Um, this is a hint to your bonus, so I'm not going to go into it in total detail. It's at the end. Um, but but again, movement complications that can happen. Unsynchronized spine. Lack of rotation uh, restricts the rolling over, let's say. Vision. Non-symmetrical ocular movements due to structure muscle tone. Sorry, I don't always read my cue cards, but but these, these are really, really important that you're looking at. Um, it, it, when a baby can't even process a horizontal tummy time, absolute horizon, just lying down, whatever you want to call it, um, don't tell me they're not going to have a hard time uh, presenting in a vertical. You know, this is this is one of the precursor warning signs that you really want to work on, so you you don't get dystonia, let's say, um, because they just they they just feel like the floor is moving and and it's going into a fall. Um, flat heads. I mean, there's plenty of papers out there that says flat heads don't that, that that doesn't affect development. Are you out of your mind? Of course, it affects development 100%. Um, and we shouldn't be going into flat heads. So we already have a developmental issues if there's flat heads. Flat heads used to be only if the child was stuck in the birth canal, but now it's second like 65% of all babies. And and two, where you see the wear pattern, the hair is missing because of the wear pattern. Again, life force intervention, oxygen, nourishment, um, and again, lack of ability to move. It's not that that your baby can't move. If we go back here, look at this. Look at how much is going on with this child. Look at how they have the arms taped. 
so they don't affect the intubation tubes. The, the baby's in a straitjacket. And you don't think that that's something that the parent should really understand? These are the movements you need to do for your child? That's what that's what you're getting here. Um, I, I really want to go into, I've covered this in a couple of sessions, so it's, it's an older slide. But again, if you don't have those life forces based on your, your breathing, balance, and heart functions, I'm telling you guys that this is this is the main your main concern. If your child had trauma within this area, um, you really want to jump on it. This is why we've done the breathing course for free for years now. Um, we really, even if you say, oh, my child was intubated, but I don't need this anymore. This is hopefully what you're learning. And this is why I like these webinars for pictures. So birth trauma. So when you're going into birth trauma, right? It's birth trauma is really considered a physical injury. But again, I don't think people see it. It's a baby straitjacket. When you're intubated, you see, see how the baby's just wrapped up here, right? And, and all of that. You've got tagoderm. You've got, it looks like a feeding tube. You've got cannulation. You know, baby's heads are propped. You're laying the baby on their back. The hips are splayed out. You know, we really have to start looking at, again, what was the birth? And this is where we have the newborn movement assessment. Well, what was the birthing process? And that's why I separate that out. And then going into, again, what, what went down with all of this that created that whole trauma. Because when a, remember what I've told you thousands of times, when a baby finds something difficult or they hurts them, they won't do them. So you don't think it's difficult to even start to wiggle my fingers. I've got IVs. I've got my arms wrapped. I've got my, you know, and again, just to show here's a movie, you know what I mean? Like, but, but, but the baby's not moving, right? You know what I mean? Mom's there and she's trying to, but, but see, it's all wrapped. But again, this is where, of course, I would be like, there's a different hand technique you could do with rotation. Um, trying to get it to birth trauma. So they're, they're saying it's six to eight out of every thousand births. Um, again, uh, two to two and a half out of every thousand children. Um, not all cases of birth trauma are, 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 are done from birth, but if you've had trauma, like say a car accident, things like that. So it's, it's technically not a birth trauma. Um, but again, they're, they're going after the prematurity, the low birth weight, uh, uses a forcep, but it, as you can see here, there's nothing about hospitalization. Um, and then going into, again, it can widely vary from, from my very mild to, you know, uh, very severe, uh, spastic quad non-ambulatory. And, and, but again, this should be evaluated with the newborn movement assessment uh, right away. So pre, you have prematurity and micropremie. So with micropremies, uh, a lot of the organs didn't come into play right. Um, and, and that's where they're. Now this baby, again, you see, even though you don't have the intubation and all that and, and, and IVs, but the eyes are taped. So look what it's doing to the vision, the cranial movement, the peripheral vision. Um, people get into the fascia, the vagus nerve, but, but you know, all that is, all that is there when you're, when you're looking at a child, um, you, you've got, the then the alarms monitors you're still in a situation where your child is prevented from movement and so when you're looking at the micro premies here now is is um so again they're saying here 37 weeks is considered premature so it's i don't know if that's skewing the data i really should research that that that, that they change that from from maybe 36 weeks to 37 weeks they're really trying to report that because you chance of surviving is so much greater. That's why we're seeing the increase of cerebral palsy. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the math is not there for that. You know, you were, we're seeing an increase of, of, of again, the, this part, the prematurity um, and, and the, the problems with delivering your baby. And then out of all the prematurities, one in 10 out of that are born what they considered uh, 32 weeks or, or younger. Um, it's so it's just, it's something to be looked at. So when I'm looking at fisted hands, okay, sorry, I thought I missed a, a spot. 
and fisted hands and feet. Okay, this is where we have a problem. One of the, the biggest signs of CP, um, the wrist either commits or the wrist either commits. And we can do this now too. So like if we open our hand and then we, we, we fist our hand, right? But we fist our hand with our thumb out. Then we start doing this. You can start feeling how the rotation, it changes and in here. Um, it's really important that that's noted right away and what can be done about it. Um, but the biggest problem is, is that people go after the hands and feet. What where it is, is that, you know, you probably were where I showed you where the baby was prevented the movement in the arms and, and the hands were kind of going. But now when the arms are free, you know, you're, you're getting those kind of responses, but you really want to go after that spine first and, and the core movements um, to going after the hands and feet. People tend to see what the problem is and that's what they go after it. I look at what the stress is, you know, alleviate the stress. It's sort of movement is like a relationship. You know, we, we have good relationships, we have bad relationships, but again, when we're in a situation where the relationship's not going well, what's the stress? The stress could be uh, an exterior force, like a job loss or family member sick or, or death and, and, and to, to work on that. But to say, oh, you two are unhappy, split up or, you know, just just be happy and, and kiss and be go out to dinner. Well, I can't go out to dinner. I still have the stress. You know what I mean? Like I still I still have those complications. My, my husband just lost his job. I can't go to dinner. We, we don't have the money. You know what I mean? So, so it's the stress that needs to be looked at. It's really no difference than you're looking at. This is, this is like the core of movement lesson right here, guys. Optimal development. You have weight transfer, transitional movements, and rotational responses. It's, it's, just, it's just pure physics. Weight transfer, I can transition from one movement to the other, and, and I can respond with rotation. Non-optional development. Again, when you have, and this goes to fisted hands and feet, when a baby has muscles that are act activating prematurely, and again, this could be an eye turning in, this could be a fisted hand, this can be whatever, tight, high tone. This is, this is the key right here. Any premature activation of muscles now bypasses weight transfer, transitional movements, and rotational responses. And that's where the delays come in. Bam, just like that. That's why the newborn movement assessment is so cute, key because right off the bat, you're looking at the rotational responses. You're also going to start to say, oh, the left side stiff, the right side is whatever, you know. And 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 but this is the science behind all my work. It's it's probably the most simplest equation out there. It's just mathematical. You know, one plus one plus one equals three. Optimal development, three key steps. Non-optimal development, you, and again, so that's why too, and there's a difference between a lazy eye. Like if a baby's tired, I'll come in here and then their eye kind of goes in as they're going to sleep. That's a lazy eye. But when your child's like this all the time, and oh, I can't even do that. And the ophthalmologist or an eye doctor is saying, yeah, but that's so common in babies. And I'm like, are you looking at, okay, are we in optimal development stage or not? Because just the eye contraction can do that. Um, uh, and, and my concern is with that too, is in, this was in the other webinar, but it's also in the, uh, the, the free PDF that I'm doing on five key warnings from the hospital is, is I'm really looking seriously at the infant monitoring system, the security system, just throwing off because it's too much weight on the body. And then you're, you're kicking in that premature muscle activation, um, even in a simple exterior force. Touch base evaluation, applied force, not from me. <laughs> when I mean it, when it's like touching butter and not leaving a fingerprint, it's your baby will have applied force. What you see is a, a startle or a spasm or whatever you want to call it. If, and again, this is where my sensory mat wants to come into play. You would see also that applied force that hit. No baby should have applied force in their movement. 
ratio complications in asymmetry and symmetrical movements. And this is where I was saying with the newborn movement assessment, that if you see the right side has differences in the left side, you know, you really want to get on that. Um, and you can do that through your touch. Um, and that would be the responses. And that's a high tone applied force. Um, and, and again, here going into what I mentioned, the inability to lie down, startles to touch. I'm not saying flicker reflex. I'm talking about just that, that, and, and people, people go into, uh, my child's got flight or flight and disarm. Guys, if this place is on fire, every two-year-old would want a marshmallow. Flight or flight is different. Like, I get it. If I've been in a car accident, I don't want to be in one again, or, you know, I, again, I mentioned relationships, you know, I might say, oh, I'm never going to, you know, um, no, that's, that's flight or flight. It's you're taking, you're taking unrealistic emotions and saying you're, you're trying to prevent a certain situation. If your child feels like they're falling, if they feel like they're drowning, meaning you put them in tummy time and, and they can't, they're distressed. I covered this in a Facebook live yesterday. They will avoid it. That's intelligence. That's not flight or flight. You can't and take a baby and put them in a position that they feel threatened. That you just can't. We we really have to understand this better. So again, I have bonus at the end, but I really want to go out for here. So so hopefully again, what you're seeing, and even if you're in the situation where your child is already in a position of, of developmental delays, global delays, or you're trying to state rare genetics, and 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 the, the the delays don't apply, or we don't have a choice because I have Down syndrome, so therefore I am hypotonic, and I'm gonna you know no you know every every movement can be improved. Going back to that equation of optimal development, you, you know. And that, and that's why too, you're, you're doing the videos. Every video I teach has that, that component of it in it. It's just pure science to help your child because why it's a functional movement. You're teaching your child a functional movement and that's where the brain changes. So, but through optimal development, you want them in the green where, where again, they're learning how to oppose gravity. They're learning how to have functional movement. They're learning how to use their, their life forces, their vision, their breathing and all that and going into that and they just develop. And then there's the red where they're succumbing to gravity. They're stiff. They can't go into the weight transfer. They can't go into transitional movements and they can't go into the functional movements. Talking about what Graham here, again, I was here and then my son whoop, went down to here. You know, that alone, he what whoops. He wasn't going up, down, up, down, up, down, in, in between. And that's what people think. I don't know if my child's delayed or not because they really did tummy time and they did rolling over, you know, but they can't come to sitting. Well, I can tell you right now, if they can't come to sitting, they didn't roll over right. Well, they only did it to the right, you know, when I start nitpicking and getting after it. And, and when I teach hospitals, it's a really important thing that I teach doctors because the neonatologists and stuff, they, they, they again, People want to brag about their babies. And all babies are in the green. Oh, they just sleep through the night. Check. Are they sleeping too much? Can you hear their cry from the other room? Well, no. You know, these are things that that a doctor needs to. A doctor feels they're there for band-aids, you know, medical. And and they are. They, you break a leg, you go to the you go to the pediatrician or the doctors. But at the same time, too, when you break a leg, especially a child, are they getting PT afterwards? Nope. You know, are they getting, you know, no, they, they don't get rehab. They don't get, a, an adult does. My dad just had more rehab than paid for and so forth, three weeks of it, um, than, than any baby recovery. My kid didn't go through that. Um, we, we just figured they're good. Take the cast off. Um, and again, we're not looking at this. So please, even though you think that all I'm here for is special needs, I'm here for all development, including your own. Um, and and that's what really needs to be looked at. But you you need a full jumpstart program sometimes when if you're checking off all those five boxes, you know, I don't care if you do a movement lesson or not, you better be starting today, not tomorrow, today to help your child or yesterday. So, and, and again, this is what we, we need to do. So first of all, step one, 
So this is where we're, we're really going into a program that is the early warning signs of cerebral palsy, the origins of high tone, movement in CP, working with high tone, and, and more. It is really, a, a, again, I'm not I'm not saying that, that I'm here to diagnose for cerebral palsy. I'm here to say, okay, if you even think you have it, if the words are coming out of your mouth, this is what I say about a hospital. The people are on Facebook. Does this look bad? Should I go to the hospital? I'm like, guys, if you're on Facebook and the word hospital is coming out of your mouth, go to the hospital. Don't ask Facebook. Because um, normally you don't wake up and say, I'm going to go to the hospital today. Um, usually if those kind of words are coming out of your mouth, you go. So again, if cerebral palsy is in the rounds of conversation, bang, this, this is it. This is your, your hit it out of the park. This is the first thing you do right now. Also too, is a super baby boot camp. It's really important for your child's development. It covers all aspects of development. So you just have that core understanding, breathing and vision and, and the spine and, and the extremities and, and development. Um, and then two, like I mentioned, is my reflex course. I, I, it, the, the power of, of movement lesson is really coming together in, in the reflex course. Um, again, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Reflexes being one of them, even the origins of reflexes and why it's there. And I just, I just think as parents, we get too much misinformation and I'm trying to narrow that gap. First of all, you don't have time for misinformation. And second of all, what you don't have time for is going down a rabbit hole, meaning anything that you're doing for a child that's not going to help their long term, not going to help their functional movement, not going to help their functional vision. You know what I mean? Is it something you need to do? I, I can't tell you. And again, it might work for some people. I'm just talking about me. The hours I brushed my son for sensory integration and brushed him and brushed him and brushed him. And gosh, I could have been doing this but i had to create this um so all together it really would be a large package because you're getting see when you're getting these 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 like now this webinar you're getting me personally for an hour you know that alone like you know you come here and work with me for an hour you know that's 140 dollars but and then you have to fly here and then you have to have hotels and then you have to have all of this so so having my personal time having me in the group but of course, you know what I mean? Like I, I have to help you. So this is the reflex course right now. It, it is 297. If you just get the reflex course, cause it's a live course. I haven't put it to bed yet. It's going live. And, um, and people, people that are in the course are going to help develop the course. There'll be a basic course, this one, and then we'll have a certification course, which is a training. Um, but because you guys are doing the webinar, you also get the boot camp and the CP program. And so, you know, you get it all and, and it's really important. Um, you, you don't want that, that path of, of, of problems going into it, but development devi deviations, it's just not necessary. Of course, everything I do, you know, it's a money back guarantee, um, but we, we want this, we, but we also want you to know the difference versus that wait and see. You want to wait and see for this, or you want to wait and see for this? People understand, don't understand. They think all wait and see is for this. What they don't understand is most doctors are waiting to see is this. Okay, we, we got a baby here. We're going to wait and see. If we're already down here, then I'm going to, you know, I'll have enough information to send the child up to neurology. And the parent thinks, well, again, like I was working on walking and and when they said, oh, he'll never walk because now he's past two, I'm like, so the goal's gone? And they're like, oh, yeah, the chances of him walking now. So we have to work on just life-sustaining life, life skills. And I'm just like, how do we lose a goal? And, and that's, again, where, where I'm trying to work with your foundation. So what's another big reason why you have high tones? Oversized diapers. Look at what they have to do to put a diaper on this child. Again, I get it. Your child is, is strapped down, but your pelvis is so needed. Look at, you know, the child's got the foot wraps, intubation, IVs, but this diaper is bigger than a horse. And you're telling me that someone can't create a diaper for, for an 875 grand baby? Um, it, it just, so there's that, there's a ton of weight on this child, 
Um, you can really see it with this one. Look at the size of that sucker, you know, and that's where they really can hinder your baby's ability to move freely. And uh, it's really is a big thing. Again, I can't thank you enough and stress that the whole thing is 297 for everything. I know you're happy to just get your child home from all of this and to go into all of that. Um, and just to know that they're safe, they're warm, and they're in your arms. But again, uh, hopefully you're also seeing that the cocktail of what could have happened during the first couple of days, weeks, or even months of your child's life um, is a lot for them to handle. And they just don't have that mind over matter. Um, and that's where here again, you think that, you know, you're being told everything looks good. Now we have to wait and see, see what the symptoms are. And you're like, oh, okay. And, uh, you know, my one client in South Africa was, was in the hospital for 79 days, um, had infection complications, uh, during in the during NICU stay, a whole bunch of stuff. So he, she was eight months old and she's telling her the, the, the man's, uh, he's he's telling the neurologist he's like can you please tell my wife to stop looking at stuff for cerebral palsy um and the neurologist looked at him he goes but that's what you have and he goes what do you mean you know I, we have cerebral palsy when when did, he goes you've always had cerebral palsy he goes you were telling us to watch he goes yeah watch for seizures watch for for the next part of it and and again and and he so he was leaving the hospital and his child's hands fisted feet all this is in the in the car carrier like this and you know another child's just like this and it just that's when like the bullet hit him and again for a neurologist to assume he goes he goes sir you were in the hospital for like 80 days like it, like the neurologist was like to 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 him saying like duh and and he's just like you know, because he he's a high end prof he's professional sports. He was number one for wakeboarding and and uh, and water skiing in South Africa. And you know, again, these 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 aren't stories. This is these are people's lives, and um, we need to to work on it. Guys, thank you so much for being here.